All right, you counted it down. Let's stand up and worship together this morning. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. And I'll raise a Savior, we are alive for 
but to your name we lift up all praise not to us but to your name we lift up We're so glad to see you out this morning. It's good to be on the hill. It's good to gather together. It's good to worship together. It's just good to be together. You know, we spent the biggest part of the last year and a half apart, it seems like, in so many respects. It's so good to be back here. It's so good to be standing here and worshiping the God Almighty. As we get ready to go into communion, there's stations around the room. You know, if you haven't picked that up yet, feel free to grab that. As we get into that communion time together, the boxes are up here as well. If you brought your offerings and gifts and you give that way, please do that as well. But, you know, this morning as I was thinking about this service, I once heard somebody say, sometimes it's not what you do or who you are, but it's who you raise. That struck me pretty deep. It's not who you are or what you do, but it's who you raise. You know, I think about our kids, and I'm so thankful for the paths they've chosen. I'm thankful they know God. I'm thankful they're walking in His path and doing ministry for Him. And I go back to Eliam a lot later, and I think about a couple named Mary and Joseph. They had no idea what was coming when they decided to fall in love and become engaged, betrothed to each other. You know, and who did they raise? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a lot of pressure. Today, Dave's going to talk to you about another young man. Now, think about his parents. He's going to talk to you about David. Remember how David fought Goliath, the giant that no one else would face. Everyone else would run to their tents. What do you think about his mom and dad? They raised a giant killer in their lives. So sometimes it's who you raise. And if you turn that around and you think about the time we're spending together getting ready to take a cup of juice and a cracker, we have a Father in heaven that's spending every day raising you and I, calling us to what we're supposed to be, asking us to follow, asking us to be true, asking us to love Him and to trust Him. And he wants that same for us. He wants to look at us and go, that's who I raised. But this morning we meet and we sing and we worship his son. who died on a cross willingly and he didn't stay there, people. <laughs> that is the most exciting thing that comes out of that book. He did not stay there. He rose again to be our Savior and Lord forever. But this morning, would you spend just a few minutes with me? And remember that sacrifice that he gave, as unworthy as we were. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy and your love. And, and God, it's, it is amazing to us that you choose us to do your work and to do your will and, and to carry out this message that's so incredible of your son who came and who died for us on a cross. He willingly gave his life as the sinless son of God so that we could have eternal life. So Father, 
Help us remember this morning as we commune together around this table once again exactly who Jesus is. Let's give all the praise and glory and honor to him. It's in Jesus' name. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your light. There is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won. Me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light, and in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise. Oh, God, our Redeemer, he is faithful to revive. Oh, he will revive. Show Shake off despair as 
I sing out your name, a victory dance. I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Well, all of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name, a victory dance. I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break. I wonder how passionately, how strongly you believe that everything is possible. That we serve a God that can do anything, that can take care of anything, that can meet us where we are and help lead us to where he wants us to be, where he designed us to be, that nothing is impossible for that God. You know, they said that the Titanic was unsinkable until it sank. In 1968, everybody believed that the Baltimore Colts were unbeatable. And then when they went into the Super Bowl, Super Bowl three, that there was no way that the New York Jets had any ghost of a chance until Broadway Joe said, we're going to win. And they did. 2015, some of us thought that the Wildcats were going 40 and 0 until they ran into Wisconsin. I got something for you later in the service, okay? <laughs> the Nazis thought their code was unbreakable. Hitler thought he was going to use the Nazi code to take over the entire world until the code was broken in 1942 and the tide changed. Centuries ago, Everybody that knew of Goliath thought he was unstoppable. Except for this kid named David. I, I'm so glad that you guys chose to be here today. I, I love this, this particular message. I'm glad that you're here. We're, we're in this series that we're calling Heartbeat. 
We're, we're talking about what it is to pursue a life of passion like David. And in this series, we're walking through different characters that David interacted with. And so I'm really glad you're here, whether you're on campus or online right now. I just want to challenge you right now to get your Bibles out. To get your Bibles out, to open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to dig into this incredible story. Uh, and if you are online, I, I pray, I, I hope that you'll engage, that you'll, you'll ask questions, you'll make comments on the website, Facebook, YouTube, whatever. And, and just to also a real quick reminder for anybody here or already online watching, if you're traveling this summer and you just want to keep up and, and you're not where you can watch... All of our stuff is on podcast, and you can check the e-news and see all the places so you can stay up with what we're doing no matter where you are. Last week, we, we saw David interact with Samuel as we kind of kicked off this series. And, and Samuel was sent to anoint David as king, and we saw how that interaction went as David is anointed as the next king of, of God's people. And this week, in the very next chapter... The very next chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 17, we see David earn some stripes as a military leader as he takes on this giant. Now, here's what I don't believe about this story, okay? I don't for a minute believe that God gave us this story, included it in Scripture, to help get us ready uh, to fight some really tall dude. I, I don't think that's why that it's here at all. In, in, in fact, in, in fact, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to make a, a, a prediction here. I'm going to I'm going to guess that not a single person in here knows anybody named Goliath. Dogs and bulls don't count. Okay, we name them that. Big dogs and bulls and animals like that. But there's no, there's no mom in the maternity wing at, at, at a hospital downtown that's getting ready to have a baby boy that is hoping that when he comes out, he's going to be so big that it's going to be natural that she wants to call him Goliath. Nobody's praying for that, all right? We, we don't know Goliath, okay? But I'm also going to make a prediction. I'm going to bet that every one of you has one. Every one of us has at least one, sometimes a whole bunch of Goliaths in our life. You see, a Goliath is any problem or challenge or obstacle or worry or sin that is standing in the gap between you and God. And your personal giant <clears throat> is standing right in the gap in the way of where you currently are and where you know that God wants you to be. And there's this chasm, there's this great chasm that your giant is keeping you from crossing. Now, the story of the heartbeat of David is critical for all of us because we're all faced with things that are bigger than us. Goliath, Goliath was bigger than David. That doesn't shock anybody, right? See, that's the cool thing about this story. I, I, anytime I'm going to share this story, every person in the room, if this is your first time in church, if you grew up in America, if you grew up in an English speaker, probably if you grew up anywhere in the world, you know the end of the story, right? Because David and Goliath is just one of those stories that the whole world knows the outcome of the story. So there's not going to be a moment of suspense. There's not going to be anything like where I'm going to throw you a curveball and like, and you're going to go, oh, I didn't see that coming. We know. So why is the story here? Goliath was bigger than David, but God was bigger than Goliath. Have you heard the old saying, the bigger they are, harder they fall, right? Let me suggest this concept to you. The bigger your God, the smaller your Goliath. In fact, that's going to be our bottom line today. The bigger your God, the smaller your Goliath. Now, now don't, don't, don't freak out on me because I'm not saying... I'm not saying that we got any kind of different gods. There is one God. 
I'm not saying that my God's bigger than your God. There's only one God, and he's bigger than the universe. Here's what I'm saying, though. The greater your view of God, the greater your understanding of God, the bigger your trust in God, the smaller your Goliath is going to be. The Goliaths in your life are going to tend to shrink. Remember the movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? <laughs> God's wanting to say, hey, I'll shrink your Goliath if you'll just understand. Now, so I'm going to dig in here, and let's look there, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's give an overview of what's going on, okay? And then we'll dig into the actual story, all right? The, the chapter begins by telling us the Philistine army, in this situation, the bad guys, okay? The Philistine army is camped over on this hillside, okay? They're camped over on this hillside overlooking the valley of Elah. Historically, that's where they are. And there's this valley, and then up the other hillside, uh, the Israelite army, in this case, the good guys, are over on this side. And they're just like on the hillside. Nobody is really <clears throat> interested in engaging in battle. <laughs> They're just like camping out, looking at each other. Nobody wants to, it's a stalemate. And then one day, this representative, a very large representative of the Philistine army comes out, takes a few steps down the hill to make a one-on-one -on -one mono -e mono challenge. He tells, he tells the people what he wants. But the fact that, that, that nobody else came out, here's what it tells me. Those guys camped out up there on this mountain, the Philistines, they were just as scared of going down into battle as the Israelites were over here. Except they had Big Brother. They, they had the enforcer. They had the trump card. They had the neighborhood bully. And so Goliath steps out. And his challenge is simple. Hey, send me someone. Mono e mono, battle to the death. Whoever wins the other army becomes their slave. Simple enough. So that's the environment that this man after God's own heart quickly sees and quickly develops a battle plan. And what I want us to do is look at the battle plan David used and see how we can use it in our own lives, okay? Now the first part of the battle plan, the first step in any battle plan is kind of obvious, but it needs to be noted. And that is you need to identify the enemy. You need to be able to identify the enemy. And like I said earlier, none of us, not a single one of us in this room is ever going to be called to fight somebody that's over nine feet tall. It's just not going to happen. But we've all got giants. And a lot of us have giants we're not willing to deal with. You know the phraseology, there's an elephant in the room. Most of you know what it's all about. You know, you've been there probably. You've been in that room sometime. That you've been in the room and there's this, un, there's this awkward, uncomfortable meeting that's going on. And like everybody in the room knows and acknowledges that there's an elephant there except for the person who needs to acknowledge that there's an elephant there. And you've been in those meetings. You've been in those rooms before. <clears throat> but we also know this. I'll ask you, uh, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. We got to take this thing on. But you'll never be able to do that. You'll never be able to attack it or eat it if you don't first identify it. We've all got giants or elephants in our room. And everybody knows about them. Sometimes except us, because we think they're okay. We think they're like our pet. This is, this is my giant pet elephant named Goliath. And we think it's okay. There's no big problem. And so what do we do? 
we ignore the addiction and maybe it'll just go away. We pretend that the abuse never, ever happened. He probably won't do it again. We try to stuff worry and depression and disappointment so deep down in the cushions of the couch that no one will ever know. So what's your giant? What's your giant? Now, in David's story, in this story, identifying the giant wasn't very difficult. The Bible tells us that Goliath was over nine feet tall. That's what most of the modern translations say. The, the, the actual literal Hebrew breaks it down in spans and cubits. And by doing so, it tells us if you do the math, he, he was actually nine feet, nine inches tall. Now, I'm a little over 6'2", almost 6'3", with shoes on. That's like a third bigger than me, okay? The tallest man in modern history that's ever recorded was a guy that was born in Illinois in 1918 named Robert Wadlow. Check this dude out. That's a tall dude. He's 8 feet 11. That means Goliath was almost a foot taller than him. And Goliath wasn't skinny either. The Bible tells us that Goliath's armor weighed 200 pounds. That means his armor alone probably outweighed David by almost double, maybe not quite double. And his spear had a head on it that weighed 15 pounds. If you've ever, ever, ever been to a gym or done any weightlifting at all, a 15-pound dumbbell, it's not really that hard to reach over and pick up. And probably everybody could curl it a few times, some, a whole bunch. Of, but you start doing it like a hundred times, or you put it on the end of a stick and try to throw it. That's significant. And so that's this guy. So identifying Goliath, the Goliath, was not a real issue. And he steps out, and look at verse 10 in 1 Samuel 17. Look at he, he steps out and look what he says. He says, this day I defied the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And then you get to verse 11 and it shows how the Israelites felt about that challenge. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul, King Saul, and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. And then the Bible tells us this that it went on for 40 days. Every day for 40 days, same ritual. Goliath steps out, makes this challenge. Everybody else hunkers back down, hides out. Nobody wants to do anything. And after 40 days, remember last week when we started off talking about David and we talked about the big ingredient last week, we talked about how he was faithful. He just did what his dad asked him to do. His dad said, go take care of the sheep. He went and took care of the sheep. When this kid, Jesse asked David, says, here, take this food down to your brothers at the battlefield, at the front lines, and then come back and take care of the sheep. It's like David was the original DoorDash driver, okay? <clears throat> and so he takes the meal down. And I just imagine he drops the meal off, but they're not in battle. They're all just like hiding up behind bushes and rocks and stuff. Okay, here's the food. And it just so happens it's about the time for Goliath's daily ritual. And Goliath steps out and starts with the taunting. And I just imagine David just kind of like freezing in his tracks. Did he just say what I thought he said? And then David starts looking at the soldiers. Did he just say what I thought he said? What are you guys doing? What are you guys going to do about that? Because Goliath was not only holding the Israelite army at bay, he defied not only the army, but he defied God. And that got the attention of a man with God's heartbeat in him. Your Goliath may not be nine feet tall. Maybe your Goliath is an obnoxious boss that you've got to deal with every day. Maybe it's an alcoholic spouse. Maybe it's a rebellious teenager that just doesn't want to listen. Maybe your Goliath is a failing grade 
or failing health or failing marriage. Maybe your Goliath's a bad habit or a secret sin or an addiction or just a bad attitude. Maybe your Goliath is worry or depression or guilt or gossip or pride. What's your Goliath? What's the biggest giant that you're facing right now? And understand this. You can't fix it until you face it. You can't fight it until you identify it. And so the battle plan, while it seems so simple, starts with just, you got to identify the giant. Identify the enemy. Now, the second part of it is then you need to do what David did and ignore the skeptics. <laughs> ignore the non-believers. Because David hears the smack talk and he can't figure out why didn't anybody doing anything. What are y'all doing up in here? And he starts to ask questions. Scroll down in your Bibles to verse 28. So David's asking questions. That's in the verse before. In verse 28, his oldest brother, Eliab, David's oldest brother, hears him speaking with the other men, and he got ticked. He burned in anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep? in the desert notice there he's kind of trying to get a, a dig in you know you're just a shepherd boy who's watching your sheep shepherd boy who's watching that little baby laying back there shepherd boy what you doing down here all right and then he says i know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is you came down only to watch the battle i don't know about you but eliab seems a little touchy to me Maybe he's still ticked off that he didn't get anointed king. And to his complaint and his challenge to David, there ain't no battle to watch, big brother, because you up here hiding behind the rocks. Don't tell me I'm just here to watch because there ain't nothing going on. And, and why would it be conceited to watch? And David wasn't talking to Eliab in the first place, so he went back talking to the other guys he'd been talking to and keeps asking questions. And finally, the king hears. And King Saul comes out. And in verse 32, look what it says. David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. King Saul, are you kidding me? You guys backing down to that dude? Don't let nobody lose heart over him. Your servant will go and fight him. I got this. And Saul says, are you kidding me? You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're just a boy. Men, listen to me. Every man in the room. Anybody in here ever had, had somebody tell you that? Back up. This is a man's job. Back up. You're just a kid back up but see in the new testament paul said don't let anybody look down on you because you're young <laughs> and king saul says to david back up you're just a boy this is a man's job now the smart aleck in me would have said well then get out there and do your job <laughs> but saul says no this guy's been fighting since he was young Here, here's what we need to learn anytime 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 that you step out to conquer a giant, you're going to face skeptics and critics. It would rather tell you you're stupid for trying to do something significant because when you do it, that points out they didn't do it. It's always, well, somebody needs to. Yes, somebody needs to. And if it's not going to be you, I got this. And so you had, David identified the giant. That was easy. He ignored the skeptics, and he's ready to go. The third thing I do is remember your victories. Remember your victories. Because when Eliab and Saul challenged David, he immediately reminds them, hey, guys, this isn't my first rodeo. This isn't my first fight with God in my corner. Look at verse 37. Look what he says there. He says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion... 
and from the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David defended his ability by remembering his victories, but he was quick to give the credit where? To God. God delivered me then, and I'm pretty confident he'll do it again. Let's go. Remember what we said earlier? The bigger your view, the greater your understanding, the, the more your trust in God, the smaller your Goliath will be. And David served a big God. So maybe what we need to do right now is everybody needs to take just a moment, just a moment. Maybe you need to spend some time this afternoon, and maybe you need to spend some time thinking about when's the last time or when was a time where you were in something that you didn't see how you were going to get out of it, and God got you out of it. He got you away from the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion. And remember your victories. Identify your giant and, and, and ignore the skeptics and remember your victories. And then focus on your strengths. Focus on your strengths. Once they realize David's serious, but this kid is serious. He's going in there. Well, now Saul's got another problem because if David goes in there in any way, shape, form, or fashion, it's going to make him look bad. And, and Saul doesn't it, understand at this moment, Saul doesn't for a minute think David's going to win. He thinks David's going to go out there and get slaughtered. And if David goes out there and gets slaughtered, he's going to make him look bad. Why'd you let that kid go out there? And so Saul does the only thing he can think of to try to save face. And he says, here, well, at least take my armor. At least put my armor on. And so David tries. <laughs> he puts it on. It was huge. It's kind of like some little skinny guy trying to put on a 52 long sports jacket. It ain't going to work. He can't move. He can't do anything. It's a miserable fit. He couldn't fight. It wasn't David. So he quickly decided to go with what he knew he was good at. And he knew that he could clip the wings off a mosquito at 50 yards with a stone and a sling. And so he walks out toward the battlefield with a sling around his belt and stops by the creek and gets five little stones. And into the battle zone he goes focusing on his strengths because he knew he could do that he had practiced swinging that thing over and over and over again here's what i know too every one of you in here every one of us in here have got some strengths have got some abilities have got some things that God has enabled us and you've worked on and, 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 improve, and, and, and strengthen those things. And God has a way of using our abilities and strengths to help defeat our giants. So focus on your strengths. Now here's the best part. Because like I said earlier, this story is not one that there's not a whole lot of suspense. You know what's going to happen. I'm not going to fool anybody. Nobody was like, I didn't see that stone hit. We know that part of it is going to happen, all right? But I think this next section is actually the coolest, most powerful part of the story. Because it's where we see David trust God. I mean, trust God in a big way. And, you know, his brothers, the other, they all, they... Goliath, he's too big. He's too big to hit. And David's attitude was, he's too big to miss. So let's go. And as he goes out in the valley, Goliath sees just a glimmer of him coming. And look at verse 43. Goliath, are you kidding me? Am I a dog that you, you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And look at verse 44. He says, come here. Come here. I'll give your flesh to the birds. Let me see you. Come here. I'll give your flesh to the birds and the beasts of the field. Malcolm Gladwell has written a book called David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. And in that book, he talks about how everybody's got like weaknesses and intrinsic, intrinsic weaknesses and, and, and giant people, like not nine feet tall, but even big, like some of their senses and like vision tends to be a thing that really, really big people struggle with after a while. And so it's like Goliath could see this, but he couldn't really see it. Like, come here, let me, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? 
come here so I can see you. And, and, and if you are who I think you are, or what I think you are, I'm going to chew you up and spit you out. But here's the good part. Look at verse 45. And if you're a highlighter or an underliner, get ready, because this is what you need to get out of this, all right? Look at verse 45. David says, hey, buddy, you come. I added the hey, buddy, by the way, but it works, okay? Hey, buddy, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. I really thought it'd be more than that, all right? The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'm going to strike you down and cut off your head. And today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? Because in that moment, David says, Goliath, I'm not just going to come after you. All your boys up there on the hill are going down too. It's not going to end well today for the Philistines. And I will give their carcasses to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. The thing that Goliath said he was going to do to David. David said, I'm not going to do it to you. I'm going to get your boys too. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And... <laughs> All right, we're getting there. We're just about there, all right? And all those gathered here will know without a shadow of a doubt that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you all into our hands. Let's go. So what's your giant? This man with the heartbeat of God knew that it wasn't his battle. He knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do when the college professor ridicules your faith? What are you going to do when the doctor says there's no hope? What are you going to do when you fall off the wagon and back into the addiction? What are you going to do when Satan whispers in your ear, just once won't hurt? What are you going to do when the boss says, if you don't lie for the company, you'll lose your job? Do you roll over in defeat? Do you give up? Or do you stand firm? In his book that Mark Batterson wrote called In the Pit with a Lion, he said, we should stop asking God to get us out of difficult circumstances and start asking him when he wants us to get out of those difficult circumstances. What are you trying to teach me, God? And so we trust him. And, and then just strictly from the battle part, this is where it gets good. About verse 48. Because David initiates the battle and charges the storm. Let me be very clear. Let me be very, very clear. Because in a world of social media where people text and post and, and do all the kinds of that stuff, tweet stuff. Let me be very careful to say this. You don't have to accept the invitation to every argument you're invited to. But you don't have to stand back and say nothing, especially when the God that you worship is defied. And I love what happens next. Verse 48 is so cool. Because Goliath said, come here, boy, let me see you. And as the Philistine moved to attack him, look what it says. Underline it. David ran quickly toward the battle. He wasn't looking for a bush or a rock or anybody. He's like, let's go. And he charged. With, some of you guys have been here a while. Remember a few years ago I told you the story about the buffaloes in Colorado? Remember the buffaloes in Colorado? They instinctively, it's built into them that when they're out there on the plain and they can see forever and they see a storm coming, the buffaloes don't run away from the storm because instinctively they know and they're, they're animals, they're big dumb buffaloes, but they ain't so dumb because they instinctively know if I try to run from the storm, the storm's going to catch me and the farther I run, the storm's going to be, I'm going to be in the storm longer if I run from it than if I turn around and charge the storm because if I charge the storm, I can run right through the storm 
and get out on the other side and be okay. And David decided it was time to charge the storm. Her king Goliath is brewing and David charged the storm. Understand this, whatever your Goliath is, whatever it is, identify it and charge the storm. But the story's not over. Because you got to finish the battle. You got to finish the battle. <laughs> Scripture tells us, we all knew, like I've been saying, we all knew the stone was going to hit Goliath in the head, right? We all knew that was coming. All right, that was not a shocker. Goliath's down. Can you imagine that moment when Goliath hit the ground? You talk about a vacuum of noise. Everybody is just like, <laughs> the Israelites are like, he did it. He did it. You can check this out. He did it. The Philistines are like, oh, snap. <laughs> and everybody's wondering, is he going to get up? Because if, if that just ticked him off, when Goliath gets up, he's going to be really mad. And so David runs over to Goliath. Did, did you notice that when he's telling Goliath what he was going to do to him, did you notice something he said? He said, today God's going to give me the victory, and I'm going to put you down. And David told Goliath, you missed this. You missed it. David told Goliath, and I'm going to cut off your head. Well, how's he going to do that? All he's got is a sling and some stones. What better way to really slay the giant than with his own sword? It's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> and David goes over and grabs the giant's own sword. And this is cool, but it's not big enough for what Goliath would have been carrying. This is a pocket knife to Goliath. I couldn't find a bigger one. But David gets the, the sword, and just can you imagine, you know, this is like in a movie, this is when the music is really picking up, okay? And, and the sword goes up, and David cuts off Goliath's head. And not only does he cut it off, this teenager, he is so cool, he reaches down and grabs the hair and lifts the head up and shows it to the Philistines, here's your boy, and then he shows it to the Israelites, and that's all they needed to charge. And the Bible tells us they came down off the mountain, into the valley, and not a single Philistine left okay that day. Because David finished the battle. David finished the battle. See... Guys, you got to understand. You got to understand that when David held up the giant's head, he was telling the rest of the soldiers, we don't have to worry about this one anymore. And when you conquer whatever your giant is, and you hold it up, not to brag about what you've done, but to give glory to God for what he's done, that you're telling everybody else that's going through and battling the same giant you're battling. When you conquer your addiction and you hold it up high so that the world can see you're telling others you can make it, you can get through it. When you hold up the giant that was destroying your marriage, you're telling other people that are going through the same battle, you can get through this. There's victory on the other side of this if they'll give the battle to the Lord. When your kid's struggling and you don't think you're going to be able to make it and you get through it on the other side and you hold that up high and you say, hang in there, you can get through it because God's going to destroy the giant in your life. That's giving glory to God, not to yourself. But it's giving hope to people that are hurting. It's giving hope to people that are struggling. So what's your giant? Maybe it's time to cut the head off. Maybe you need to grab your phone right now and start deleting some numbers. Uh-oh, it just got real, didn't it? Maybe at home, there's some bottles that need to be emptied out. Maybe you got some business trips planned that you need to cancel. 
the more real God becomes in your life, the more victorious you'll become as his child. Because the bigger your God, the smaller your Goliath. Would you guys stand? Would you guys stand with me? Here's the deal. Jason's going to be down here. Uh, Bradley's in the room. We've got elders in the room. So I want this to be a worship experience as we finish. But I want everybody here to be honest with yourself and with God and to identify some giants in your life. And, and, and just this as we sing and as we worship to give those giants to God because the battle's not yours in fact if you think the battle's yours that's why you're losing the battle because you're fighting it on your own and the battle's not yours it belongs to him and if you're fighting it without him as your Lord and Savior that's the biggest battle you're fighting right now because Satan's telling you, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Satan wants you to be a superhero. Because he knows as long as you try to be the superhero, he's already won. But when you surrender and say, this isn't my battle, big boy. This battle belongs to the Lord. Now it's about to get real. And you're going to be ready to slay some giants. So I just want to ask you to pray. If you need to talk to somebody. Uh, Jason. Bradley, Elizabeth's down here. You can talk to some ladies, some folks around. Come on. Let's go to war. Let's slay some giants. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain. I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows Of my soul is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living Lord. who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Listen to this. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me. Christ. 
that seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me and then came the glad you guys are here that story finishes up not only did not only did David hold the head up not only did David hold the head up so the armies could see it but when it was all said and done he took that head and he gave it to King Saul the king who had lost stride with God the king he's gonna replace and he just said hey here you don't have to worry about this one anymore so glad you guys are here. If it's your first time, man, we've got a gift for you. You picked a great day to be here. We got a gift for you out in the lobby. The I knew while Brett and his team are out there. Uh, if you've been trying to figure out kind of what your next step is, uh, and you're interested in joining the church, you're interested in giving your life to Jesus, like four people did last week. I mean, it was, how cool was it that we got to witness a baptism in the lake on Memorial Day? I mean, that was so cool. And, and, and so God's doing stuff. But if you want to come to Pathways, our next Pathways is Jan, uh, June uh, 22nd. And you can go to the Next Step room back there and sign up for that. And don't forget this journey we're on of reading through the New Testament this summer. Uh, there's cards with the plan up here on the front and on every table out in the lobby or it's on you version as well. And listen, you guys. Like, if you don't have anything to do for the next hour or so, and you want to stay around and bring some energy to next service, that's okay, too. We'll let you do that. But I uh, didn't get the response I was hoping for there. <laughs> uh, but if not, if you're leaving now, then get out of here and go love God, love people, and change the world. And we'll see you next Sunday.